Hello and welcome to Bacteria. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into how bacteria cause disease. And after you've watched this video, you will understand the extent, origin, and functions of the human microbiome. You'll appreciate the ways that bacteria enter and spread in their hosts. You'll be familiar with the different types of bacterial toxins and their activities and you will know the mechanisms of action of members of the different classes of antimicrobials and how resistance emerges. Before we talk about bacteria that cause disease, it's very important to first discuss the human microbiome, all of the microbes that live in and on us. We're home to trillions of microbes, trillions, and that's what we call the microbiome, and it's a composition of all the microbes that are everywhere in us and on top of us. A human body is only 25% human cells. Now, look, you can see me. You think you're looking at just human cells. 75% of what you see here are bacteria. Very, very little human cells, bacteria, fungi, and archaea. It's amazing. Wherever the human body is exposed to the outside world, there's a microbial community, the mouth, the lungs, the GI tract, the urogenital tract, the skin, and probably other places we haven't even found it yet. This microbiome is just beginning to be unraveled in terms of what it does for us. It certainly helps us to extract energy and nutrients from the food we eat, but it also appears to inhibit the growth of pathogens, not only in us, but on our skin. The microbes on our skin produce antimicrobial compounds that protect us. It's remarkable. There's probably much more that the microbiome does. For example, recently it's been shown in animals that the microbiome helps their immune system to develop. It's really, really remarkable. In the coming years, we'll be able to sort all of this out. But it's quite clear from the very early days of our existence, when we're first born, our microbiome forms, and it has a huge impact on our health. Microbes contribute an extra 2 million genes to the 20,000 or so genes that our human genome encodes. 99% of our genes are bacterial. Isn't it remarkable? Our microbiome weighs two and a half pounds. That is weight you'll never be able to get rid of. You can try and lose some of your body fat, but that two and a half pounds of microbiome needs to stay with you. Otherwise, you're going to be very unhealthy. And don't forget the viruses. All those bacteria and fungi and archaea in us, they also are accompanied by their viruses. In fact, viruses outnumber bacteria by about five to one in us. And it's quite clear that they have major roles in regulating the microbiome. The volume of the microbiome is about three pints. The next time you drink three pints of beers, I want you to remember you've just drunk the volume of your microbiome. It's my way of getting you to remember what I'm telling you here. Now, where do you get this microbiome? There are many ways. While you're developing in utero, you are bathed in amniotic fluid provided by your mother. And of course, it's going into your mouth and on your skin, and it's got bacteria and viruses in it. So that's your first encounter. You're acquiring your microbiome in utero. Then as you are born, you acquire more of your microbiome during birth. If you so happen to have been born by passage through the birth canal, you will start to acquire the bacteria that are present along that canal, not just in your mouth, but on your skin. People who are born by cesarean section, they don't go through the birth canal. Of course, they come out through an opening in the skin produced by surgical manipulation. They have a very different skin microbiome from children who are born vaginally. So it's probably better to be born through the normal routes. You acquire probably a more beneficial microbiome. But of course, in some cases, it's not possible for health reasons. You also acquire a good amount of your microbiome from your mother. Your mother is one of the first to hug and kiss you, and she continues to do so, hopefully, 
for the rest of your life. And your father also contributes and any caregivers who may come into your home, they are all contributing to your microbiome. Breast milk is a very important contributor to your gut microbiome. Again, breastfeeding is not done by everyone, but it's been shown in many studies to be better indicators of subsequent health. You also acquire microbiome from the soil that you may touch. You should let your kids play in the soil. It's probably good for them to help acquire their microbiome from the water that you wash yourself in and drink, uh, from the foods that you eat, and any people or pets or plants that you encounter uh, early on in your life. The early years are formative years, and then you acquire a relatively stable microbiome that is very similar to that of your family. And only when your health changes or if you move or change your diet do you change your microbiome. And the consequences of the microbiome for human health are going to be learned in the next 10 years, and we're really going to find out fabulous ways that we can improve our health by manipulating it. Okay, on to infection basics. Let's talk about some principles by which bacteria can enter the host. We can just divide bacterial infections into two broad groups, depending on how they're acquired. Some are acquired exogenously from some external source, like bacteria in the environment, or bacteria in the food, the water, the air, the objects we touch, insect bites, or any animals, dog bites, for example. And so those are exogeny, exogenously acquired from elsewhere, and that contrasts with endogenously acquired infections, where our microbiome suddenly turns on us. And this could be because uh, we've altered the microbiome by treatments with antibiotics, and clostridial infections of the intestine are a great example of that, where we alter the composition of this family of microbes, and then suddenly clostridia overgrow and cause us problems. Sometimes injuries introduce skin bacteria into us, and this is commonly occurring with staphylococci, normal inhabitants of the skin. When an injury introduces them below the skin, this can cause a problem. So we get bacteria that cause infections and illness from external sources and from within ourselves. Let's talk a bit about how bacteria gain entry to the host, the exogenous sources of infection. Here's a human body which provides a very large spectrum of places for bacteria to enter. A very common place is a mucous membrane. We have mucous membranes all throughout our body, our eyes, our mouth and nose, the entire uh, alimentary tract, which is essentially a very long tube starting from our mouth going through our intestines and out the anus. That is all lined with mucous membranes because it has to absorb food and excrete waste. And because it's a mucous membrane, it is vulnerable. It is not sealed against entry. Things like breathing, eating, having sex, all can introduce pathogens into us. Cholera, whooping cough, and gonorrhea are example of bacterial infections that are acquired across mucosal membranes. Now, we are happen to be covered by a wonderful protective organ called the skin. The skin is the biggest organ in your body. It weighs the most, and it has the most square area. And it is a great barrier. The outer layer of your skin is dead, so viruses cannot multiply in them. They have to get inside by penetration. But there are ways that the skin can be breached, allowing bacteria to invade the underlying cells and tissues. How can this happen? Insect bites, of course. They routinely deliver things below the skin. Any kind of scratch or injury, which we're all prone to having, will also breach that wonderful protective barrier. Once you're in a mucosal membrane, there are ways to get across that, which are even easier than in the skin. You typically don't need an injury. Here's a cross-section of the intestinal mucosal barrier. And on the left side is the lumen of the gut, the space on the interior. And the first line of defense is an epithelial cell barrier. And below that are the submucosal tissues. And that also contains capillaries and lymph capillaries. So if a pathogen can get across the epithelial cell sheet, it has ac access to the circulatory system, which can bring, us and bring it anywhere. And of course, below that are the muscle cells that help to contract 
the intestine during digestion. If we take a closer look at this intestinal lining, we can see that there are different kinds of cells that make up that epithelial sheet. There are enterocytes, which are involved uh, in taking up nutrients, and then interspersed among them are the so-called M cells, in which immune cells come from below lymphocytes and macrophages and sample the contents of the gut to make sure there isn't anything nasty there. Both the enterocyte and the M cell can be points where pathogens can cross into the underlying tissues. Once a bacteria has adhered to the epithelium, which many do, as we'll talk about later, they can move laterally, reproduce and move across to contiguous tissues, or as I said, they can penetrate the epithelial sheet and disseminate to distant sites. Our immune defenses play a big role in limiting such incursions, but they don't always win and bacteria do enter the rest of our body. Once a bacteria or many bacteria are in us, they typically multiply in order to cause disease. And this graph shows a time course of some typical infections. The x-axis shows you time, and the y-axis shows you various parameters, including the production of bacteria uh, and red and uh, immune responses. So there is a period initially after the bacteria enter us called the incubation period. This is an extremely point important concept. This is a period which is variable among the different infections during which the bacteria are multiplying, but we don't yet have overt disease. During that period, immune responses may be mounting, but again, and you may have, you may have fever as a consequence of that, chills, aches, and so forth, but you won't have the actual symptoms of the disease. That is the incubation period. Then as the bacteria multiply, they may either elaborate toxins or they may invade and, and cause tissue damage. Uh, you have a period of disease, and if you follow the red line and go above the blue segment of this graph that says no disease, Above the blue is where we have bacterial disease, and this can be a consequence of both uh, the immune response and direct effects of bacterial toxins, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, on us. There is a very important part of this graph which shows no disease. Some bacterial infections where the bacteria are replicating will not result in disease. These are called asymptomatic infections, and many people have these. It's a consequence of them being able to control the replication of the bacteria, and others may have uh, simply more resistance to disease formation. And the outcome, of course, of a bacterial infection can be recovery and cure and subsequent uh, immunity. It can be, unfortunately, in many cases, death or in some cases immunity is not lifelong and we obtain recurrent illnesses with the same pathogens. <music>